Hello, Chem 20 students. So today we're looking at our last section. So looking at titration curves and the indicators that we would use for our titrations. So getting right into it, a titration curve is sometimes also called a pH curve. And it basically just gives us some important basic information about the titration reaction. So it's just a graph that illustrates how the pH is changing over the course of the, the acid-base reaction. So in order to um, work with titration curves, you do need to make sure that you're familiar with the standard way that we label them. So on the bottom, we always have the volume of titrant that's been added. And this is essentially showing us like at, because volume changes over time right like as the titration proceeds you're adding more and more titrant so this is also kind of you can think of it as showing the reaction progress over time however we'll always be labeling it with the volume of the titrant that's being added on the y-axis we always have the ph and so our curve is showing how the ph is changing over time. Now, I don't want to get too much into detail with this um, until we look at a more specific example. Um, the last thing to remember is that you always have to have a title for your graph or your titration curve. And so the title is usually going to be like titration curve or just, you don't even have to put that in, but you could just say like titration of I don't even really care like if you're working on a test you don't have to put in this information but you could just say like titration of hydrochloric acid with sodium hydroxide okay but make sure your graph always has a title if you want full marks when you're doing written questions on the test so let's look at a really specific example here so same graph that we were just looking at but let's think about how that relates to what's happening with an actual um, titration so in our burette, we have our titrant, and then in our Erlenmeyer flask, we have our sample. And so, like it says here, we're starting out with our sample, which is acidic, right? So the graph is always measuring what's happening in this Erlenmeyer flask. So we have acid solution. So if we were to think about the pH at the very beginning before you start adding any of this titrant, we would just have this acid solution, which means that our pH would be really low. Okay, now as we add in the sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base, we're going to see that, you know, some of the sodium hydroxide is going to start to neutralize the hydrochloric acid. And so we're going to start seeing the pH of this sample increasing. Okay, now all of a sudden, once there's been enough sodium hydroxide added to fully react with all the acid solution, we're going to see that all of a sudden the pH curve sharpens basically to a vertical component here. And so what that means is, um, you know, you hit a certain volume of this titrant that's been added, and that's kind of like the magic spot where there's been enough of these molecules to react with the acid to bring us to kind of a neutral um, solution, right? So they've completely neutralized each other. So we have this vertical expanse here, and right in the middle of that expanse is what we call the equivalence point. Now this can be variable depending on what you're reacting, but for Chem 20, you only need to know the reaction between a strong acid and a strong base. And for a strong acid and a strong base, this point here, the equivalence point, is always going to be a pH of 7, right? So a, pH, a strong acid and a strong base are going to have their equivalence point always at pH 7, at perfectly neutral, okay? So... <clears throat> Reading off of this graph, um, oh, sorry, and one last thing would be after that equivalence point hits, if you were to keep on accidentally adding this sodium hydroxide, like remember the goal of titration would be to stop at this point, but that doesn't always work out perfectly. So if you were to keep adding, then we're going to see the pH continue to increase because now you're going to have more sodium hydroxide than there was acid. So they've neutralized, but you keep adding more base. And so the pH is going to start like keep on increasing. And then at some point, it's going to start to kind of level off at whatever the pH of this base is that you're adding. Okay. So that's why we see this general shape of, you know, kind of this weird S shape. And it's really important for you guys to be aware that this shape is specific to a strong acid sample being titrated with a strong base. 
If this was a base to start out with, we'll see the reverse of this shape because we would have to start at a high pH if we had a base in here. And if we were adding acid, we would see the reverse happening here. Okay, um, so really quickly, also you should be able to read these graphs. So the pH of the original sample is going to be right at the beginning here. So I'd say maybe one just to be a nice even number, even though it looks a little bit below that. Uh, when the reaction completes, the pH is, so after the reaction, we should see that pH of 7 because that means that the reaction is totally complete. However, if more titrant is added after the reaction completes, then the pH is going to be, I mean, it's kind of hard to say, but I would say it depends on how much you add after, but I'd just say more than the pH will be greater than 11, right, is look looks where it's kind of starting to branch off of our straight line here. So it's going to keep on increasing um, if you keep adding more. So in order to kind of think about what's happening here, we want to think about our net ionic reaction. So in the titration we just looked at, we had sodium hydroxide reaction reacting with hydrochloric acid and of course we know that's going to neutralize because our hydroxide ion is going to join with our hydrogen ion to form water and then our sodium and our chlorine are going to join together to make a salt. Now if we think about our net ionic reactions, um, so we've cancelled out our spectator ions which are going to be sodium and chlorine and ion making water, right, so neutralizing. So when a strong base reacts with a strong acid, the net ionic reaction is always going to produce water. And like I mentioned, these are the only types of reactions that you'll have to work with for titrations in Chem 20. Um, so this means that the main chemical change in the reaction is the production of water, which is neutral. So um, for this reason, we always have a a pH of 7 at our equivalence point for the strong acids and bases, like I already mentioned. Okay, So you're always going to have that perfectly neutral pH of 7 because of the production of water in these strong acid, strong base reactions. The equivalence point on a titration curve is just the midpoint of this kind of rapid change. So whenever you look at any titration curve, like I mentioned for you guys, it'll always be 7 for you guys, but you could look at any titration curve and basically if you wanted to find the equivalence point, you would look for where does it look like this curve is starting to straighten out into a vertical line and where does it look like it's kind of starting to branch off there and halfway between those is going to be your equivalence point. Okay, so if we had the pH was beginning to change at this point, which is about 3, let's say, and this one is at about 11, then halfway in between would be 7. Okay, um, so something you have to know is that when strong acids and bases are titrated together, the equivalence point is always seven. Wow, I really, really wanted to make sure you guys knew that. <laughs> I didn't think I would have that written down yet again. Um, okay, so let's see. And just to be aware of, like, when you guys do a written question on on a test for this, you will have to identify the equivalence point. So just make sure that you not only mark it, but write down, like, pH equals 7 for it. Uh, let's see, strong acid titrated with a strong base. So like we've already looked at this example, when you have a strong acid with a strong base, the shape of the curve is always going to be starting low and then we'll have that kind of vertical component, you know, at some point and then the and then it's going to flatten out again. You guys aren't going to be expected to really like have exact values marked for your volume. Um, you should have your pH marked, but even that, like I'm not expecting you to know the exact pH. So if you just kind of have this kind of a shape sketched out for your pH curve, if it's a strong acid and strong base, then that'll be fine. Okay, so don't worry too much about knowing the exact vol volumes and pH. You just need to know the general and make sure that the midpoint of this lines up with whatever you've marked as a pH of 7. Um, now, like I mentioned, if we have the opposite, so if you had a strong base as your sample and you're adding a strong acid titrant, then you're going to have the exact reverse shape here. So basically you're going to start out 
with NaOH in here, which has a high pH. So it's going to gradually start decreasing as you're adding in the hydrochloric acid and the pH is becoming more neutral. Then we're going to see that same sharp vertical decline. And then it's going to start to smooth out again at the end there, which is if you continue to add the hydrochloric acid titrant, it's going to um, kind of level out at a low pH, right? Whatever the pH of the hydrochloric acid is. Now, if you were looking at a weak base and a strong acid, they would have a pH, um, a, they would have an equivalence point at a pH less than seven. So for example, here we have hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid. We add a weak base to it, which in this case is um, ammonia. And so we'll see that we see the pH kind of like increasing here. And then instead of the pH balancing off at a higher value, we see that the pH kind of levels off, you know, below 10, I would say there. So it makes sense that your pH would be less than for a strong base here, which means that the distance from, you know, where your curve starts to change to the end of it is going to be shorter. And so that means the midpoint will be lower. So in this case, you know, it's a pH of like about six is where the equivalence point is. But that makes sense, right? Because you're not going as high in your final pH because you don't have a strong base. And the same thing is true if you had a weak acid and a strong base. So if you're starting with your weak acid, your pH is going to be higher. And so even though you have a strong base, which is also higher, again, the distance between those two is going to be shorter. So your equivalence point is going to be raised up a little bit there. Okay, so hopefully that kind of makes sense. You won't be asked to be able to draw these curves um, for anything on the test, but you should just kind of have a general understanding of why the pH might be or sorry, the pH of the equivalence point might be different if you don't have a strong acid and a strong base. So the other thing we want to look at here really quickly is um, the different types of indicators that we can use for these titrations. So with an indicator, basically what happens is you have it in the sample, right? Um, so for example, if we look at this, you have the indicator already present in the sample. And then as you add the base, you start to see the color changing. Um, so I think that would have been shown in the video that you guys would have watched of how titrations work. So at, as the pH changes, you're going to start to see flashes of the color changing um, in response to the changing pH. And then you know to stop it when the color changes start becoming more permanent so when they don't just kind of like flash and disappear and so we want to have an indicator that is going to change color at about the equivalence point okay it's never going to be perfect because we know that indicators have a range of of ph's that they change over um but it'll give you a pretty good uh, um indicator of you know where your equivalence point would be so how do you properly choose an indicator? Basically, once you know what your equivalence point is, and like I mentioned for you guys, it's always going to be seven, um, then you can start to look for what would be the indicators that change color around that range. So for example, when we look at our strong acid being titrated with a strong base, you know, here's our kind of like changing point and about halfway in between is our equivalence point, was, which is at about a pH of seven. Um, so they've ended up choosing the indicator methyl red for that one, which I don't know if I'd pick that one quite as much because the pH changes a little bit lower. Um, let's see, methyl red. Right, so here you can see it changes at about 6.0, although actually that would probably work because that way you know that the color has fully changed before you hit the equivalence point of seven. So it allows you for a little bit more experimental error. Um, so that one could be good. Some other options they could have chosen would be, let's see, chlorophenol red would be like just before seven. Um, Actually, yeah, it looks like that might be about the main one. You can also use ones that are changing over that range. So like, um, well, that one might be a little bit tricky because it goes up to 7.6. Yeah, so actually methyl red and chlorophenol red might have been about the best 
answers that we would have at least out of what's listed in our particular chart of indicators. For this next one here, we have a weak acid being titrated with a strong base. So again, we're going to see that because it starts balancing off at a higher point in the graph, it's going to have a higher midpoint, right? Like the point between about here and there is up here. So we have a higher equivalence point than for the previous graph. And so again, we're like looking at an equivalence point of maybe nine-ish or so. So they've chosen phenolphthalein, which changes from between 8.2 and 10. So again, that one might have been appropriate. Uh, yeah, there's not a lot else there that would work super well. So you always want to choose something that's going kind of from like the lower range of where you should start to see your equivalence point. So 8.2 to 10, and we're at about like 9-ish here. That one should be okay. All right. As long as you have kind of the general range in there for whatever indicator you pick, you should be fine. So don't stress too much about it being exact. Um, here again, we have another curve that you can see. So down here, they've basically just picked out some different um, indicators that could work at different pHs. So if you were to look, we have a couple of different options here. And as you can see, like alizarin yellow here changes between 10.1 and 12. So you, you wouldn't want to have it as your indicator because it's not going to change at the equivalence pH. Same thing, thymol blue um, is between, well, 1.2 and 2.8 or 8.0 and 9.6, but they're obviously just referring to this lower one. Um, and even for the 8.0 to 9.6, that'd be too high for our equivalence point. So these ones are not good indicators for the equivalence point, but bromothymol, which has a uh, bromothymol blue, sorry, which has an, a range between 6 and 7.6 would be a good choice for a pH or an equivalence point of pH 7. Okay, um, so maybe just to kind of help you guys out a little bit, I'll walk you through these practice questions and then um, we'll look at polyprotic curves and then we'll be finished. So hydrochloric acid is used in some toilet bowl cleaners. An experiment was designed to compare the concentration of acid in different products. The burette is filled with standard NaOH solution. Sketch the titration curve for this titration. Label each axis and include a title and indicate the equivalence point. So basically your title would be um, like titration, Ooh, this pen isn't working too well on this paper, titration of HCl, I think it was, HCl with um, NaOH. There's your perfectly fine title. And then we just set up our axis like this. We know we're going to have pH here and we're going to have volume of titrant which in this case would be NaOH. So on the test, make sure you do specify what the titrant is. And then um, we just want to skip. So we've labeled each axis. Make sure also if you're doing a test, you read each point and make sure that you've crossed it off. Um, lots of students forget that. Okay, so label each axis. We did that. Include a title and indicate the equivalence point. So again, we're, we have a strong acid, hydrochloric acid, with a strong base. So our general shape is going to be kind of like this. Ooh, that might not have been the very best, but whatever. And then let's say pH 7 right here. So we would just go like this, and we would just write equivalence point. Uh, pH 7, something like that. Okay, so we've indicated the equivalence point, and that's everything that you would need to do to get full marks for a question like that. Okay, the solution is also on the next page if you wanted to look at that. Um, the next one we have our titration that's happening. What is the final burette reading at the equivalence point? 
So with this one, they're kind of trying to confuse you by throwing a whole bunch of numbers in there um, because it almost seems like you would have to do all your titration calculations. But if we read this carefully, we see that it's just saying the initial burette reading is 11.64 milliliters. And what is the final burette reading at the equivalence point? Okay, so because we have our values listed here, we can actually just kind of do an approximation. So we need to just remember that with a strong acid, strong base titration, we just have equal volumes of the two components in order to titrate them um, or to bring them to like neutral, right? And so we can say we have a 20 milliliter sample here of the sodium hydroxide and our initial burette would be at 11.64 milliliters. So let's just kind of sketch out what our burette would look like. So we're at 11.64 um, milliliters. And we're going to assume we need to add about the same amount as we have of the base. So we're going to go down by 20 milliliters. So then we just kind of need to remember um, what is the final burette reading? our burette is going to be going uh, down to like whatever the maximum is. It could be 50 milliliters, could be 100 milliliters, let's say 100 ml just in case. So because we start at zero at the top of our burette, sorry guys, my artistic skills are minimal. <laughs> so if we start at zero um, and we go to 100, so but what we actually started with was like our fluid volume was at 11.64 and then we have a difference of 20. So just remember that means you're increasing by 20, not decreasing. So that means we would be at 11.64 milliliters plus 20 milliliters, which would give us 31.64 ml and if we look at our list we see that that works out well we know that we couldn't have done uh, minus 20 anyways because you would have ended up in a negative value which probably would have given you this like let's see 11.64 probably would have given you something like this but just remember you can't ever go down to a negative value that's why when you're actually doing your titration you want to make sure that you have enough Sorry guys, my mic just cut out there. Um, so that's why when you're doing your actual titration, you always want to make sure you have plenty of volume, um, at least as much as you have of your sample in order to ensure that you won't run out of it. Because otherwise your work is going to be really messed up. Okay, last thing here, just really quickly, polyprotic titration curves. We don't have to look at these in detail because you'll learn more about that in Chem 30. Um, but basically, just like with, we learned a little bit about polyprotic um, substances. So with a polyprotic ti titration, you can see if it's possible for more than one proton to be transferred in a reaction. So all of the curves we've looked at so far are for monoprotic titrations. And so they only have one equivalence point. Whereas if you have more than one equivalence point, the number of equivalence points shows you the number of hydrogens that can be gained or lost. So for example, this is a titration curve for H2SO4, right, which has two hydrogens that it can transfer. And so the shape we see goes like that kind of shape we're familiar with, but then it's going to keep have, it's going to have another kind of plateaued gradual increase. And then we're going to see another sharp increase there an equivalence point, And then it's going to kind of level out again. For polyprotic titration curves, you only need to recognize what the shape represents. You don't have to give any details. You don't have to calculate anything. You don't have to list an indicator. Just recognize, you know, the two different um, curves mean that more than one hydrogen could be transferred. So like if you were asked, could this be a titration curve for HCl? You would have to know that that's not possible because HCl only has one hydrogen to transfer. Okay, so just make sure you're aware of that. All right, and that is everything, you guys. So go ahead and work on your chapter review and do some practice questions on titration curves. And good luck on your last unit exam.